Today, we will be discussing how community engagement can help us expand our reach, engage new partners, and help stretch our limited dollars. Here to share some expertise on the matter is Cindy Winters, the project advisor for the Rural Health Transformation Center. Cindy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, John, and welcome to the Broadening Community Engagement Webinar, where we'll share our lessons learned from the Heart and Neuron Project in engaging the community to reduce the prevalence of heart disease and heart attacks in the small rural community of New Ulm, Minnesota. Over the next 20 to 25 minutes, we will share our lessons learned and provide recommendations to avoid the missteps that we took so that you can accelerate your community health improvement work. These are the objectives that we plan to accomplish during our time together. We hope to help you think a little bit differently about community engagement so that you're successful at implementing and sustaining your community health improvement work. Reframing and broadening your concept of community engagement will make the work easier, solidify community partnerships, and expand your reach while cutting down on your overall costs. This approach does take time and effort on the front end, that can pay big dividends on the back end. The lessons we're gonna to share today are taken from the learning guide, the power of true community, true engagement for population health that was published by the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation's population health team in conjunction with Academy Health. The learning guide provides population health initiatives with guidance on how to foster stakeholder engagement in key activities and achieve broader mission ownership among community partners and observers. This guide summarizes 10 best practices for effective stakeholder engagement along with associated case studies that support the best practices. It isn't possible to do a deep dive into the guide today, but we will briefly go over those best practices. The guide will be available for download when you receive the email with the webinar recording. So let's just jump right in. So what exactly is community engagement? I believe we all think of it a bit differently. From the poll you took before this webinar started, some of you define community engagement as the residents or employees attending and participating in the programming efforts. Some of you view community engagement as getting partners around the table to help do the work. Others think of community engagement as grassroots efforts to push for policy initiatives with local government, and others think of it as cost sharing. And it really is all of the above, which 73% of you said that you believe it is. So research has shown that in programs with high levels of community participation and control, there's greater participation in community health improvement activities. Best practice number one is to engage the right stakeholders and partners. To fully realize population health improvement, it's essential to get the right people around the table to inform the initiative from start to finish. Once key stakeholders have been identified, defining the specific problem to address becomes easier. The group's work can then turn to setting specific goals and objectives by leveraging existing community data and resources, identifying desired outcomes and using its collective expertise to prioritize, inform, implement, and measure the results of interventions or next steps. In order to do this, you need to define your target audience early on. The more narrowly this is defined, the more likely it is that efforts to reach and effect change in that population will succeed. Then ensure that key stakeholders include representatives from the entire range of the target audience and reflect its diversity. Stakeholders will be key players in developing, implementing, and evaluating the population health intervention project. So engaging those with a varied array of knowledge and skills is critical for success. Best practice number two is to enable open two-way communication. This may sound like common sense, but at times it becomes an afterthought, too late in the process. There are a variety of ways to gather input and it's likely to be an iterative, iterative process, especially for initiatives that have a planned timeframe of a year or longer. 
the best way to obtain feedback depends on the project scope and target audience. Various approaches, including community surveys, key informer interviews, focus groups, or community and town hall meetings, provide opportunities to garner feedback, create the best interventions, and gather project support. Throughout all stages of the work, use stakeholder input to revise strategy and approaches. It's often beneficial to solicit feedback multiple times in various ways, as it plays a valuable role in informing key decisions, driving process improvement, and enhancing the final outcome. It is critical to develop a follow-up plan to share your learnings through these methods so residents know what decisions have been made as a result of their input. Closing that communication loop is critical to keeping them engaged, encourages them to continue to provide input because they know how the information is being used. Best practice number three is to align around a common vision. From the beginning, help key stakeholders to buy into the mission, scope, and expected outcomes of the work. Identify a common mission and vision, focusing on a specific community help need. This focus can help in narrowing the project scope, setting expectations, engaging key stakeholders, and ensuring the ongoing, ongoing progress of the collaborative or initiative. A fairly easy technique to creating a common vision is to create a vision board. The Heart and Yuan project worked with the Heart and Yuan leadership team to create our vision board. We took old magazines and asked the team members to cut out pictures of what they envisioned you want would be like when we were successful with the project. They were asked why they chose the pictures they did and we had a discussion around those choices. We asked questions about the different words they used to describe the pictures, so we weren't assuming we knew what they meant when they used those words. We then used those words to make up our word cloud that's at the center of our vision board. By doing this exercise, we all knew what we meant when we were describing or talking about the project. We were speaking a common language that we had all agreed upon, and there weren't different interpretations of the various words, which often happens in groups. While the membership of the leadership team has changed over time, we often review our vision board and the word cloud and explain how it came about so the new mem newest members of the team remain on the same page as the veteran members. I readily admit that this was not an activity that everyone enjoyed or felt was necessary, but it helped to strengthen the partnership, which is so critical in community engagement work. This group will have to make some tough decisions over the course of the initiative, so it's important that they know what each other means when they use a specific term or phrase, and it helps to reduce the assumptions that often occur when groups meet and discuss various topics. Best practice number four is to clarify clearly defined roles, responsibilities, and authority. And in the poll that we took prior to the beginning of the webinar, 65% said sometimes they have, they clearly define these roles and responsibilities. So my question is to you, how many of you have been involved with the board or committee where you just weren't sure why you were there or felt it was worth your time? I recently stepped off of one of those committees within the last year and have never really regretted it. When you ask people to come to the table to help with an initiative, they need to be given a role, and then they need to be allowed to take responsibility for that role. That's often really hard for us to do in the field of healthcare because we feel like we're giving up control. But if we truly want sustainable community engagement, we have to give up that control and let the organizations around the table that have the experience take the lead and the responsibility. How liberating is that? To give up some of the control and serve as a support rather than the lead. It's their community too. We have to have faith and trust in the partners that we bring to the table. They too have the best interests of the community at heart. We can help frame up strategy and provide guidance, but we don't have to be, nor should we be responsible for all the work. We need to be a good partner and allow those we bring to the table to do what we brought them to the table for and not just their opinion. They will stay longer, they'll take ownership, and the work will be sustained in the long run. Best practice number five 
is to use a community asset mapping process to identify the positive attributes and resources available in the community. It helps to identify connections or relationships between individuals, between individuals and organizations, and between organizations. Asset mapping serves two functions. One, it helps to discover expected and unexpected key stakeholders to engage in a population health initiative. It, two, it initiates a process that a community can ultimately use to mobilize the identified resources and help solve its own health problems. As an example, communities can leverage available electronic health record data to map and target individuals at higher risk for heart disease due to high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, or other conditions. They can then employ asset mapping to identify available community resources and any existing gaps. Best practice number two is to identify partners to access and generate data. For all population health initiatives, developing relationships with various stakeholders with access to data is essential for success. Using collective data can help prioritize community health issues. Explore ways to leverage points of alignment by working together, share resources and data, and aligning strategy to maximize the impact of collective actions through effective coordination of potential resources. It's important to begin this work as soon as possible as it is feasible in order to fully exploit those, these partnerships. It's important to revisit the process from time to time as the work evolves, or as new, group mem new groups are formed within the community to attract and engage new stakeholders and modes of support. Best practice number seven is to develop a collective long-term financial strategy. It's imperative to develop a financial strategy with key stakeholders so that ownership, commitment, and role clarification to the strategy for the long-term engagement, to identify opportunities for in-kind donations, as well as direct monetary support of the Population Health Initiative. This can take many forms, such as pro bono services or administrative staff support, donation of space, volunteer time, prizes or supplies, cost sharing or promotional support, such as free display ads in local newspapers, public service announcements, and more. Planning for long-term financial security needs to start at the beginning of the project or programming so that it can be determined whether the initiatives being planned are sustainable or not. Our experience has been that if an initiative has been offered and it was successful, that the community comes to expect it to be offered on a consistent long-term basis, whether it is financially feasible or not. That's not to say you shouldn't do some big fancy events to bring attention to the project, but it's important to be aware of in your planning for the future of your financial stability. Developing a long-term financial plan takes time and expertise from a different set of partners, ones that have more experience in financial planning. With the Heart and Yuan project, we created a sustainability team looking at how to sustain the project financially, and we invited some financial planners to help us determine the best path for us. Unfortunately, there is not one universal funding model out there. We researched many different models, and they were all specific to their location and partners around the table. It's also important to share the finances with your core or leadership team on a regular basis. One of the mistakes we made early on with the Heart and Yuan project was to not share the finances with the team guiding the work. Since our project was a research project, it was well-funded as research is expensive. But the mistake we made was not sharing how the money was being spent and what was coming in to support the project. The team and consequently the community felt the project had plenty of money to complete the 10 years of research. So when it came time to ask the community for financial support so we could complete the project, there was pushback because we hadn't kept them informed. It took a couple of years to overcome that obstacle and we still struggle with it today. The project is continuing, continuing in Yuam even after the research has been completed. But continued funding 
is still a challenge because we never set up the expectation that the community would need to provide funding. It's a really hard obstacle to overcome. Best practice number eight is to establish credibility and engender trust. When implementing an initiative, it's crucial that the voices of healthcare and public health professionals do not drown out stakeholders' voices, especially from the target audience. Building trust among the partners and community members is critical to community engagement. Learning to speak our partner's language and what motivates them helps to build that trust. Contrary to our belief that health is a top priority, that isn't always the case with our partners. So we need to understand what motivates them. We need to learn to speak their language so that we can frame up our health message in a way that builds trust and helps establish a high level of credibility. We have to be willing to compromise knowing that we will eventually get to where we wanna be. Without strong partnerships and a high level of the trust, we won't get there at all. There is such a thing as the speed of trust. We get to our intended outcomes faster when we have trust among our partners. Best practice number nine is to diligently build community capacity. The community asset mapping process will help to determine where there are gaps in knowledge or expertise among stakeholders and within the community. It's important to acknowledge these gaps so that experts can be invited to address those gaps. For the Harden Your Own project, we brought in a national transportation consultant to help us prioritize the areas that needed improvement as we worked to improve the environment for people who walk or bike. We also brought in a regional expert to provide education on policies and the role they play in community health improvement work for the Harden Your Own leadership team. We have sent people to national or regional conferences rather than going ourselves so that they can develop a network for sharing ideas and understand what other communities are working on. We also share links to newsletters and webinars on topics that motivate our leadership team and that pertain to the work that we're doing. We try not to inundate them, but we want to keep them up on the science of best practices. And best practice number 10 is viewing health as a shared value. Integrating health as a shared priority in all individual, family, organizational, government, city, and school agendas is necessary in order to weave into the fabric of the community, health into the fabric of the community, and to maximize the opportunity for the community to reach its full health potential. To do this requires stakeholders key stakeholders to understand the impact of the individual's health on others. Supporting health throughout the community also requires understanding where health issues fall to be prioritized among other competing priorities, such as education, transportation, safety, gun control, infectious disease, etc. Using data in a persuasive way helps people understand that health is not only caring about those with chronic disease or illness, but also about preventing disease, reducing costs, and improving policy systems and environments. Ultimately, this understanding helps stakeholders feel increased ownership in the initiative. This is my contact information and the services that the Rural Health Transformation Center is well positioned to provide. We have 10 plus years of experience on the ground <clears throat> working in rural communities to improve community health. The Heart and Yuan Project was success has successfully reduced the number of people with high blood pressure, we've lowered cholesterol, improved triglycerides, increased physical activity, and fruit and vegetable consumption. We've taken these lessons we've learned and packaged them so that you can, we can help others accelerate their community health improvement work. We know this work is challenging and is not a sprint, but a marathon. We're hoping with our help, your marathon won't be longer than necessary and you won't bonk near the end. We offer customized consulting, technical assistance coaching calls, presentations and webinars. We will re re prepare a report on a specific identified issue in your community to help you get over, to get over the hump 
and then provide we also provide local workshops to motivate your key stakeholders and partners and we also offer to come have you come to New Alm to experience our success and meet with members of our leadership team? All of these services are reasonably priced and we're willing to work within your budget to meet your needs. For more information on our work, you can visit the MinneapolisHeart.org website backslash Rural Health Transformation Center to learn more and to also download the learning guide and our services sheet. Thank you so much for your time and interest in this topic. Now, John, I believe we have some time for questions. Are there any in the queue? There are quite a few, and thank you, Cindy, very much for sharing your time and expertise. We really appreciate that. Um, like Cindy said, we're going to open it up for Q&A. There are a few questions in the pod, but if you uh, don't know how to submit a question, um, you need to access the control bar, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, to access that, you just drag your cursor to the bottom of your Zoom screen, which will pop up the control bar, and please uh, select the Q&A pod and uh, submit your question. Uh, and Cindy, the first question that we have in the pod is, what process did you use to determine the roles and responsibilities for the partners? So we did um, a literature search and found some various different roles and responsibilities, and we used those as a template. And then we actually went over the roles and responsibilities and the team themselves adapted those to meet our particular team needs. So they had a say, and mm -hmm. what their roles and responsibilities were going to be. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, looks like there's a couple more questions in the queue. Uh, the first of which being, how did you determine which partners you needed at the table? That's a really good question. And I think it, so the asset mapping will really help you decide who needs to be at the table. And then I went around and, and interviewed people from different organizations to see if they really understand understood whether they had a role and responsibility in community health and then how they perceived it that they would provide that service to their either their clients their employees their customers um, it's really important for the people at the table to understand that they do have a role and to visualize how they feel that they're going to fill that role as well so really understanding your partners and having conversations with them. It's not always just the organization that needs to be at the table. It really has a lot to do with who that person is from the organization that's at the table. Excellent, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, the next one, this attendee writes, how did you involve community members in this process? We have done a lot of community we did started out doing community summits and that is one of the things that we um, stopped doing about midway through the project because we weren't getting as much input as we had initially start thought we would we also conducted mm -hmm. focus groups a variety of focus groups we did key informer interviews so we would just go out and have conversations with people and ask them questions we did um, written surveys we did online surveys we just we kept we asked we continually ask questions at every opportunity and we really try and listen to our community members mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so the next question, and this uh, for now is the last question, but do you have any suggestions about how to best reach less accessible populations? For example, the homeless or those without internet access? That's a really good question. And I would start out with the organizations that provide them with the services that those individuals access if they do access services i would start there because they are the ones that have the expertise with those populations and um work with them to find out the best way how do they get a hold of them how do they work with them and then allow them to be the ones that help you bring them to the table because they have evidently created a level of trust with them and they would probably be more open with that organization than you potentially with a new initiative starting in the community. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that we always did on almost all of our surveys was ask people where they got their information and went to for information so that when we put out information for the community, we made sure that we used those communication avenues as well. Right. 
Well, thank you very much, Cindy. It looks like we just have one final question, and that is why is sharing the financial picture of the project so important for sustainability and community ownership? I think it really helps the community understand that they have a responsibility as well for their health and that sometimes that does come at a cost. Um, if you do everything for free, you set up the expectation that health isn't necessarily a value in the community, that it's up to just one or one or two organizations to provide that to the community but it there is an expected cost and it doesn't have to be a lot um, then it just makes it easier for that financial support and to know where the money's coming from and that there is going to be a continued need for funding. Healthcare can't be the only ones putting money into this kind of initiative and grant funding is not in perpetuity. Yes, totally agree. Um, well, thank you for answering those questions, Cindy. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to say before I sign us off here? No, nope, I just, if you have more questions, this is my contact information. The Rural Health Transformation Center It is really interested in working with others. We have learned a lot in our 10 plus years in the community and we want to see you be successful in your work and we want to be able to help you to achieve your outcomes. Exactly. Thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, you can get more information about the Rural Health Transformation Center and everything that we offer. You can access all of our tools and resources via the link that I posted in the chat pod. Uh, if you're interested in our work and would like to receive more information, or if you have questions, feel free to email us at populationhealth at mhif.org. Um, otherwise, if you have specific questions for Cindy, she did put her contact information on the screen there. Um, so on behalf of the Rural Health Transformation Center, thank you and have a great day.